Welcome to family Bible time. I know I didn't finish my <laughs> sentence. I don't finish my sentences. But welcome back. We are in Genesis chapter 16 and Matthew chapter 15. We're going to be having quite the time today with Abraham and Sarai and Hagar and a mess in Genesis 16. Let's pray. We'll need God's help. Oh, and um, excuse me, young lady, we need you to turn over the timer. Let us begin. <laughs> Father in heaven, thank you for this uh, time in your word. Thank you for the privilege of reading your word. We pray that you would you would speak to us. Lord, we ask you to help us. We pray that you'd forgive us. We pray that you would Give us insight and understanding and lead us through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai <coughs> said to Abraham, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant, it may be that I shall obtain children by her. Now that was a custom in those days, that if you couldn't have children, maybe you would use one of your servants and they would have children and they, you would kind of have them, keep them as your own children. But this is not God's plan, is it? This is God has promised to give Abraham, Abraham offspring, and in, and now it doesn't seem to be happening. So you say God has made a promise and it doesn't seem to be coming to pass yet. What are we going to do? Oh, let's take it into our own hands and make it happen somehow. Mm. Hmm. Not a good idea. All right. Abraham. Abraham. I want to, always want to call him Abraham, but that's not yet. Abraham listens to the voice of Sarai, which is what Adam did with Eve. Uh-oh. Um, same phrase, same problem. Abraham should have known better. It's his fault as well. So after Abraham had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abraham's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abraham, her husband, as a wife. Oh, well, that's kind of like the same mistake that the people were making back in Genesis chapter 6 and, um, and in with Lamech and his two wives in Genesis chapter 4 and in Genesis chapter 10 you see people taking several wives and it's just a mess isn't it now Abraham's doing it He's, and it's going to be a mess and you say oh no when you get to this bit <laughs> And he went into Hagar, that means they slept together, they had sex, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Oh boy, this is a problem, isn't it? Actually, this is a common problem. So now Hagar says, well, I can have babies, but you can't. Well, that's not very nice, is it? That's really not very nice. And it's actually incredibly common for people who can do something because God has given them the ability to do something, like they're good at sport, to look down upon people who can't do it. Oh, you can't do it. You're useless. That's really common, isn't it? Amongst children, you see that, but you also see it in grown-ups. You say, oh, well, Hagar, hold on a minute, what power do you have to make yourself conceive? Absolutely none, right? I mean, you, nobody has the power to make themselves able to conceive. That's what God gives you or not. And if God has withheld it from you, that's not necessarily your fault. And if God has given it to you, that's no credit to you. That's a blessing, isn't it? And so you should never look down upon someone. Let's say this. Um, this is common even amongst ignorant, foolish Christians who start to think, oh, I'm having, I'm having, I have babies easy. So what are you doing wrong? 
to people who find it difficult to have babies. Anyway, people can start looking down on others very quickly. And this now is upsetting the household. It's changing the relationship between Hagar and her mistress. I mean, she's her servant, but now she's starting to look down, look with contempt upon her mistress. Mm. Verse 5, And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. Hold on a minute. Who started this? It was Sarai, wasn't it? But now Sarai is realizing... It was, she's blame shifting, but she's actually blame shifting back to Abraham, whose fault it really was. I mean, she recognizes that it, it takes two to tango, that he went along with this, but now it's all working out badly. And who is ultimately responsible? Actually, it is Abraham, and she puts it back on his shoes. Um, no, that's the wrong expression. <laughs> Okay, it's, well, you know, back. <laughs> she puts it back on him. I have no idea where that came from. <laughs> May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant into your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with me on contempt. May the Lord be judged between you and me. But Abraham said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Things are not good in the in the Bram household, are they? It's just, I mean, things are really bad. Oh, may the you know may the Lord judge between me and you. What she's in your hands. Do with her what you want. Okay, this is not a comfortable day in Abraham's house. Then. Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. I mean, this is all going messy, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Where did it start? Well, it started with walking by sight and not by faith. They were they stopped trusting the Lord. Trusting the Lord, by the way, means being willing to wait, being patient, being willing to wait. Faith often means waiting. When we don't see what we've been promised yet. So verse 7. The angel of the Lord. Praise the Lord. God sent his angel. Found her by a spring of water in the wilderness. And the spring uh, on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai. Where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from my mistress Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her. Return to your mistress and submit to her. I wish they translated that a little bit more literally. I, I think in in verse 8, if you translate it more literally, it says, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress Sarai. Which is interesting because in Jonah, Jonah's fleeing from the presence of the Lord. And this verse would give you an indication that in this world, in the biblical world, that phrase, fleeing from, fleeing from the presence of, was just a phrase, not literally um, meaning, so when it comes to Jonah, not necessarily meaning I'm fleeing from the, the presence of, but I'm just, I'm running away from. If that makes sense, I, I hope it makes sense to you. It's just interesting in biblical interpretation. And a more literal translation is helpful to spot things like that. I read it in the NASB this morning, and it's translated like that. Anyway, the angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit to her. What? Sarah is being harsh with Hagar. Surely she should run away. Nope. No, according to the angel, the angel of the Lord said to her, I. Now, who is this angel? Mm. Now, I will surely multiply your offspring mm. so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. The angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son and shall call his name Ishmael. Because the Lord, that's Yahweh, has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man. 
That's a nice description, isn't it? His hand shall his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him, and he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. Oh, the angel is mm-hmm. Yahweh. The angel <coughs> of the Lord is the Lord. Mm. Oh, hang on a minute. Is there more, more than one person in God? Mm. Oh, even back in the Old Testament here, you're getting clues, aren't you? Um, we'll see it again in chapter 18 and chapter... 19, and we saw it already in chapter um, 1 and chapter 3, let us make man in our image. Oh, hold on a minute. It seems like there's more than one person in the Godhead, and there's only one God, but it's plural. It's plural, that's how... You could say God is plural. Uh, And so this is amazing, isn't it? Anyway, little hint. She says, surely... um, She called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. For she said, truly, here I have seen him who looks after me. Mm -hmm. So she saw the angel of the Lord and she saw God. Wow. Therefore, the well was called Beer Lahai Roy, which has got nothing to do with beer, except that beer is talking about a well. Beer Lahai Roy. And uh, that means you are the God who sees me. It means the well of the living one who sees me. Thank you. It means the well of the living one who sees me. I'm reading the wrong footnote. I wonder why that sounded really wrong. <laughs> I don't have footnotes anymore. You don't have footnotes anymore. Oh, dear. Okay. Therefore, the well was called Beer Lahai Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. Well, that was interesting, wasn't it? So, Matthew, chapter 15, which means that today is January, day 15, which means it's, oh, happy birthday day. (laughs) Someone has a birthday. When you're watching this, it's her birthday. She's 21 again. Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? I don't know how they said it. They probably said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They were a sconce, weren't they? They were, they were, they, these people were kind of, Shocked. Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? What is this tradition of the elders, by the way? Well, this was a body of teaching that had been gathered together and handed down through all the Jewish rabbis, the Jewish teachers, the elders, and actually became, after this date, it became put, gathered together and, and put together into a body of teaching that was called the Mishnah, And the Jews, to this day, if you go to a Jewish rabbi, they study the Mishnah, amongst other writings. But the Mishnah is this oral tradition of the elders that's been written down. And and their accusation is in verse 2, for they do not wash their hands when they eat. (gasps) Shocking! He He answered, well... It's a good thing to wash your hands when you eat, isn't it? But they didn't mean just washing your hands to wash the dirt off. They meant kind of a ceremonial washing of the hands that they had to do in all these special ways. And you can see Jews still doing that today. Before they eat, in order to wash off any defilement from contact with anything impure 
religiously, not we're not talking about just cleaning your hands. He answered them, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? What? Jesus is kind of exposing them a little here, isn't he? For God commanded, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If anyone tells his father or his mother, What you would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites. Can you not keep moving that around? You hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, These people, this people honors me with their lips but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Uh oh, <laughs> that's exactly what they were doing, isn't it? The commandments, that these were traditions. These were not inspired. They were not from God. They were extra biblical. They were outside the Bible. They were the traditions of men, just traditions. There's nothing wrong with having a tradition. We don't have a great deal of tradition in this house, do we? we Except don't. for birthdays and Christmas. We have some traditions, don't we? We celebrate <laughs> birthdays. We celebrate, like, a, 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 we, yeah, we do have some traditions. We sing happy birthday to people. You could say that's a tradition. We would feel like we hadn't properly celebrated a birthday if we didn't sing someone happy birthday, mm -hmm. like tomorrow. But today, for you, if you want to sing a happy birthday, go ahead. You could sing it now at home. She's listening. Hang on, we can't hear you. I'm just joking. Um, but traditions like that, well, what, what are they? They're just ours, aren't they? They don't belong to God. They don't have the authority of God attached to them. But these Jews had kind of taken the traditions of just mere men, but then started teaching them as doctrines, as if, like, they were true. And laws. Well, um... And that you could go to Israel today and you could follow, see the Jews all religiously following all the details of the, of the Mishnah and the, the, the teachings are passed down and handed on and there are hundreds of them and Jews, have, Jews if they're going to be truly religious, they have to do this and they have to do that and they have to do this and they have to do that. And they've got to go through all these ceremonies and religious things to keep the traditions of the elders. And Jesus says, hypocrites, that's, well... <laughs> This was a bad day for these Pharisees and scribes who came and opened their mouths and, and accused Jesus, <laughs> wasn't it? They got more than they bargained for. Anyway, uh, he called the people to him and said, Hear and understand, verse 10, verse 11, It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They're blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain the parable to us. He said, are you still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the stomach passes into the stomach and is expelled? Whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled, unless you have a stomach for a mouth. I'm, uh, that was me just trying to correct my own mistake, sorry. What, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, oh dear. <laughs> Okay, so what comes out of the mouth? What, what is it that comes out of the mouth? Your words. And this defiles a person. For out of the mouth come evil thoughts. You think and... What? Heart. <laughs> I'm really struggling this morning. Out of the heart, thank you. Out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, 
sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. A little comment in passing. Let me see how much time we've got. Yes, I like this. Do you like this? I think you will. Um, little comment in passing. Okay. Out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false, false witness, slander. Do you see those things in you? Evil thoughts. Murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft. I, I said this last year, I think probably when we went through this, but I remember walking around the woods. Do you remember that? Um, I was walking around the woods and I was seeing piles of logs and we have a log burner and I was thinking, those piles of logs are just sitting there and the government, local government here wants to just leave them to rot for the bugs. They want, the, they want to have homes for the bugs. So they chop down trees in the parks and then they just leave the logs there and you're not allowed to touch them because they want lots of homes for bugs. And I'm looking at it thinking the bugs have plenty of places to live, but we could do with some free fuel. But in my heart, I want, I suddenly started thinking of ways to go and get them. And I'm thinking, hang on a minute, that's theft in my heart. There was the desire to take, which was that which was not, mine i hadn't bought it it wasn't given to me so that would be stolen but i saw in my heart well that's that's the that's the desire to steal if you have a desire to take something that doesn't belong to you it's not been given to you it's it, you haven't bought it well well that's stealing isn't it where does that come from it comes from within it comes from the heart you have to repent of it quickly don't dwell on it don't let yourself um start looking at it and thinking about it but the same is true with murder with adultery with sexual immorality with lying false witness slander these are what come out of us now listen um if you see that within you what does it say about you it says that there's a problem in you doesn't it, it says that you have sin coming out from you you can't blame someone else that's the way people do it. You can't, you can't look around and say, well, where did that come from? Okay, the answer is, Jesus says it came from inside you. So you have to have God give you a new heart. But you're going to actually still have this sinful heart in your flesh until the day you die. So you have to actually deal with your sinful heart. And you have to ask God to forgive you for those things and you have to uh, repent of them and you have to seek to mortify the flesh with all its affections and lusts all the desires all the all the likes of your sinful heart you, uh, you 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 have to mortify you have to put them to death and that's what the bible teaches anyway that's just a little aside uh, verse 21, and Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. Now, what did Jesus, what kind of thing would Jesus say to something like that, do you think? He'd say, of course, I'll come with you straight away, wouldn't he? What did he say? But he did not answer her a word. <laughs> Hang on a minute. Why would Jesus not answer someone like that? Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Daddy. Yes. Thanks, we're good. But he and his disciples came and begged him, saying... Send her away, for she's crying out after us. And he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Oh, hang on a minute. Well, he said that in her hearing, but she came and replied. But so that's kind of, it seems like a weird and almost harsh thing to say. But actually, when Jesus sent out his disciples in Matthew 10, he said, don't go, go only to, he said, go only to the lost sheep of Israel. Don't go to the Gentiles. Don't go to the Samaritans. 
Now, Jesus' mission, the disciples' mission, was first and foremost to the Jews. Nothing wrong with that. God chose the Jews. God sent Jesus as the Messiah to the Jews first. And even among the Jews, I have not come to heal. I've not come to, uh, you know, it's not... It, uh, <laughs> The healthy do not de- need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus, even amongst the Jews, was only really coming for the ones who saw themselves as in need spiritually. And the people who thought they were fine, Jesus really hadn't come to save them. So he says, I was sent only to the lost ha- sheep of the house of Israel. Um, but he says that in her hearing. Why would he say something like that in front of her? Now, I think what he's doing is he's drawing out her faith. Look at what she says. But she came and knelt before him saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. That's just a phrase. It's not, it isn't right, is it? If I took your food and gave it to our dog, you'd say, oh, it's my food. Um, so it's it's... Jesus' way of saying, we shouldn't, we shouldn't skip my mission. I'm here for the Jews, and, and it's not right to take what's for the Jews and give it to other people. It's not necessarily saying that she's a dog. It's just <laughs> using that phrase. And she said, but she picks up on it, verse 27. She said, yes, Lord, yet yeah, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. She's now pleading with him, isn't she? Please give me any something, anything. And Jesus answered her, Oh, woman, great is your faith. Of course, he knew that, didn't he? But he's drawing it out from her, and he's going to let her show just what amazing faith she has. Great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. Oh, don't you love it? Verse 29, Jesus went on from there and walked by beside the Sea of Galilee. He went up a mount on the mountain and sat down there. And great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, the crippled, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they put them at his feet, and he healed them. So that the crowd wondered when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healthy, the lame walking, the blind seeing. And they glorified the God of Israel. Where was Jesus? Verse 21, and he went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Now he's gone beside the Sea of Galilee. This is Galilee of the Gentiles. And they glorified the God of Israel. So this is this is now the people in Tyre and Sidon getting a sample of what Jesus can do. And it's the G- Galilee of the Gentiles, that area, getting a sample of what Jesus can do and people from the, among the Gentiles are glorifying the God of Israel. Then Jesus called to his, his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the crowd because they've been with me now three days and I have nothing to eat. And I'm unwilling to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. His disciples said to him, where are we to get enough bread in such a desolate place to feed a crowd, a great crowd? And Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? They said, seven and a few small fish. And directing the crowd to sit down on the ground, he took the seven loaves and the fish, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up seven baskets full of broken pieces left over. Those who ate were 4,000 men. Besides women and children. After sending away the crowds, he got into the boat and went to the region of Magadan. Whoa. Okay, hang on a minute. When I went to school, my religious, I see it, my religious instruction teacher, the vicar of art, the chaplain of art school, said to us, oh, these were just... It was just one miracle, and it ended up as two stories about the same thing and ended up in the Gospels in two different places. That doesn't work. 5,000 on one occasion, 4,000 on another. 
12 baskets of scraps, 7 baskets of scraps, 5 loaves, 2 fishes, 7 loaves and a few fish. These, these are two different stories, aren't they? Okay, well, they could get changed by Chinese whispers. Well, they, they could, but actually we're going to see Jesus talk about the two miracles mm -hmm. and ask his disciples uh, uh, specifically about, you know, how many baskets did you gather up when we fed the 5,000? What about when we fed, fed the 4,000? And he's going to talk about these two separately. Anyway, just a little aside my vicar said this was a miracle of sharing. Um, Jesus doesn't need any help, does he? He's able to just look at the fish and the bread and turn it and multiply it if he wants to. Can God fix our problems today? Father, we thank you and praise you for giving us such a blessed time in your word. And we pray that you would be with us. We pray that you would help us throughout this day and help us to trust you. Help us not to take things into our own hands like Sarai and Abraham. Uh, help us to look to you to do your work and help us to have the faith of the um, that Syrophoenician woman who, who trusted you so implicitly and begged for help. Lord, please help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, we're out of time. God bless you, camera queen, do your stuff. We will see you, God willing, if the Lord wills and we live, tomorrow. And we'll say tomorrow, happy birthday, but you can say happy birthday today.